Our scripture reading this morning will be out of Luke's 11th chapter and verses 27 through uh, 36. These verses constitute what is really the second part of a unified section that began in verse 14, where we found Jesus uh, casting out this demon uh, from a man who was deaf and dumb. There were some of Jesus's enemies uh, present there, and some of them accused him of performing the exorcisms he had been performing by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. But others, according to the 16th verse, uh, were testing him by demanding from him a, a sign from heaven. And we covered last time, two weeks ago, the Lord's response to that first accusation and the warning that he gave in his response, and that ran from verses 17 through 26. Today, we will pick back up in verse 27 with his rejoinder to those who were insisting upon some grand celestial uh, sign. But at the start, uh, Luke records in verses 27 and 28 what appears to have been a spontaneous reaction to the Lord's ministry from an unidentified woman in the crowd following him, giving the occasion uh, to articulate very clearly what has been an underlying uh, message in his teaching all along. So we read uh, in 27, while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. And I'll just pause to say that's where the title of the lesson uh, comes from, and we're going to try to develop that. Uh, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. A challenge that uh, greets us uh, every single day of our lives, every moment that we, that we live. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah was a prophet of God, but someone greater than this prophet uh, is here, Jesus says. Verse 33, no one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. The eye, so he shifts here. I'm going to try to explain this. Uh, in 34, the eye is the lamp of your body. Uh, when your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, an evil eye, your body also is full of darkness. Then, and here's the warning, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. There's been a theme uh, running through the last couple of chapters of the Gospel of Luke. I, I'm calling it something like a stealth uh, theme. Uh, it remains stealth until J Jesus states it uh, strongly and clearly in his answer to this woman who shouted out the blessing on Jesus' mother in verse 27. The, the woman had not been wrong in her observation about Mary, uh, that she was especially blessed 
for having born Jesus, but Jesus points the woman to a much greater uh, blessing that accrues to all those who will listen to the Word of God and then go and observe it. It's a lesson for you and me uh, today. But we've been prepared for this theme in the last few lessons, beginning, I think, uh, at the return of uh, the 70, uh, those, those witnesses who went out on that special uh, witnessing campaign in chapter 10, uh, they came back gushing with enthusiasm over the evidence they had seen of the authority and power of Jesus' name. And Jesus had responded in verses 21 through 23 of chapter 10 uh, along the lines of, you don't know how blessed you really are. Uh, there is this divine conspiracy, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to hide these enormous truths from the wise and the intelligent and reveal them instead to those who will receive them with the innocence of, of infants. You remember that, that paragraph, how blessed are you? Uh, or, or I give thanks, Father, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and instead chosen to reveal them to babes. And that's step one, step one. Uh, to be on the receiving end of divine revelation. That's step one. So if you're here this morning and you belong to Jesus Christ, uh, step one has been uh, effected upon you. But then Jesus gives an illustration in the figure of the lawyer, remember, who comes to him asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. And so the theme now is voiced. Uh, it has something to do with doing, uh, doing the Shema, as we described it, the great commandments of the Torah. And when the lawyer begins to squirm a bit in regard to that requirement to love one's neighbor, and Jesus instructs him with the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, concluding by asking him who proved to be the neighbor in the story, uh, the lawyer nailed the answer, the one who actually did show mercy to the one in need. And then Jesus told him, remember, go and do the same. Then Jesus continues his journey and we find him in the household of Mary and Martha. And Luke describes how Martha was doing all sort, sorts of things but not the most important thing. And that was what Mary was doing, uh, sitting at the Lord's feet, uh, soaking up his word. She had chosen uh, the good part to do and, and set aside the less important. And then comes our present chapter, chapter 11 in the passage which precedes ours today. And, and there Jesus warns against divided loyalties. Uh, there can be no neutrality he warns in verse 23, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. There can be no halfway commitment, no vacillating, no double-mindedness. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. The Lord demands our full obedience and not just lip service. He deserves our undiluted uh, devotion. And again, it concerns not what you merely say, but what you do. It's James 1.22, prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. But here now, uh, there was a woman in the crowd as Jesus was saying these things. She had obviously been listening intently to him and she was taken aback, not just by the brilliance of the things which he spoke, but also the authority with which he, he spoke them. And almost without thought, I think, she let loose with what was in her heart. And she shouted out, blessed is the woman that bore you and the breast at which you nurse. Any woman uh, would have desired such a son who would grow to impress um, like Jesus impressed. That's what we do. We project onto our children all different kinds of things. It's ridiculous, really, but I'm embarrassed to think about it. But that's, that's what she uh, wanted. Blessed, 
I would like a, a son like this one. So blessed is uh, your mother. And Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was uh, blessed to have borne him as her majestic magnificat proclaimed. Remember, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed, she had said. Uh, her relative Elizabeth was in agreement when Mary, uh, newly pregnant, uh, came to visit her. Elizabeth's own baby leapt in her, leaped in her uh, womb, and she exclaimed, blessed are you, Mary, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So Jesus obviously would not have disagreed with this woman, though it may seem as though he uh, corrected her. Uh, this phrase in my Bible in verse 28, on the contrary, uh, translates a single uh, Greek um, compound word that expresses an insistence on moving to the more significant. So, so his meaning would have been something like better still, or, or better rather. Uh, so he was saying, yes, but better still, blessed or those who hear the word of God and observe it. This was the higher uh, truth uh, and one that Jesus insisted upon more than once. In fact, we've already seen it in our study in an earlier chapter, in chapter eight, when Jesus's mother and his brothers uh, came to visit, but they couldn't get near because of the crowds. And so they told him, uh, look, uh, I think that's in there. Behold, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting uh, to see you. Uh, but he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So we see this theme uh, running throughout the, the gospel. And that, in fact, uh, was the very posture of Jesus' Jesus's mother as described in the gospels. She knew the word, she held it dear to herself, and she submitted to it without reserve. She was courageous. We could go on and on about uh, the courageous obedience of, of Mary, Jesus' mother. And so uh, Jesus would have had the same natural affection for his physical mother as any son, uh, but it was a person's spiritual affiliation with him that grew more and more in importance. And that would be his continued uh, emphasis uh, through the end of his earthly ministry. Indeed, uh, to the last moments, his desire that his followers uh, hear his word and, and actually uh, observe it. We saw it illustrated uh, very recently in Dan's study in the Gospel of, of John. And uh, there in that last a bit of, of John's gospel, uh, the risen Christ was with his disciples on the seashore and he turns his, his attention to Simon Peter and he said, Simon, do you love me? And, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Three times he did that. Uh, three times because three times Peter had failed uh, to do uh, to observe uh, Jesus's word. So it was rehab rehabilitating him. That's what, uh, that's what Dan said. And Peter went on to live a life uh, that was exemplary uh, of, of doing the word of, of God. But in the meantime, here uh, again, as the crowds around Jesus kept increasing, in verse 29, he takes up the second charge his enemies had made, uh, the demand for a sign. It wasn't as if he had performed a no miraculous uh, sign, uh, but it wasn't enough for them that he had healed the sick and given sight to the blind and, and hearing to the deaf. Uh, cast out demons, fed the 5,000, made the lame whole, brought the dead back to life. Uh, the landscape of Galilee was littered with the joy and relief brought about by Jesus' powerful and compassionate miracles. But they apparently wanted something more spectacular still, like a 
perhaps a, a visible sign from heaven, some kind of celestial phenomenon that would titillate the crowd and offer positive, proof positive that his works had come from God. But that was the exact thing contrary to what he desired from them. That's not what he wanted from them, which was that they would hear and obey the word he brought to them as though it was the very word of God, which of course it was. Uh, this was the Jewish leaders and even the crowd's great failure. Uh, they continually failed to respond to the light Jesus had brought to them, to the, to the word which he uh, proclaimed to them. And that had already been uh, visibly, vividly illustrated in the reaction of the, the crowds to his ministry uh, previously. Luke recorded it in chapter 4 as did Mark in that memorable scene in his first chapter. Uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, had, had repaired to uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house. Uh, she was sick. Uh, Jesus healed her. Uh, she gets up and goes about uh, serving uh, everybody. And then as the sun began to set to, uh, to end the day, the townspeople began to bring in all the sick, all the lame, all the demon possessed. They lined up outside the door and he was up till <clears throat> late in the night ministering to these people. Uh, Mark uh, claimed the whole city had gathered at uh, the door of Peter's mother-in-law. And the next morning found Jesus up before dawn praying at this secluded uh, place, but the crowds clamored still more after him, seeking after the wonder of his signs. But Jesus resisted them saying, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. This is why I came. It was for this purpose that I came. His miraculous signs had given authentication to the truth of his words but it was the message he brought them in his teaching that was the important thing. So when he would skirt their insistence for yet more miracles and instead continue on uh, with his mission, they repeatedly reacted with rage and sought to destroy him. There's multiple scripture references from the gospels that testify to that. They hated him uh, for it and they wanted to destroy him uh, because of that. And that's plainly the feeling we get from our passage. Uh, Jesus is actually delivering a verdict. This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and we're to understand that they were continually, over and over, asking for this, for signs, something to excite them. His word was not enough. It never was. His word was never enough for them. And that was indicative of the sin and evil in their hearts. And yet no sign will be given to it, he says, but the sign of Jonah. So uh, here we're, we're going to see the Lord condemning them by calling to the remembrance uh, two famous incidents from their ancient history in which Gentiles responded to God's word. Uh, the first from the prophet uh, Jonah to the Ninevites and the second, the queen of Sheba coming from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But in what way was Jonah a sign? How was Jonah a, a sign? Verse 30 reads, for just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Well, Matthew's gospel uh, gives us uh, some help uh, here. For he cites Jesus uh, saying something almost identical in a different setting. In Matthew chapter 12, he describes the same challenge for a sign thrown up against Jesus by some scribes and Pharisees. And he gives the same answer as uh, here. This is Matthew 12, 39, 40, 41, right through uh, there. He gives the same answer as here, except he goes on to expand on his answer there 
Uh, no sign will be given the evil generation, he says, but the sign of Jonah the prophet, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, <clears throat> one amazing event uh, related by the prophet Jonah about something that God did in his life is analogous, in other words, to the greatest event ever that God did in the life of his son. What happened to disobedient Jonah and his being swallowed up by uh, the great fish, one of the great vacation Bible school <laughs> stories that we have from the Bible, but what happened to him in being swallowed up by this great fish and then entombed, so to speak, in the belly for three days and three nights and finally miraculously delivered from death, spit up on the, on the shore of the, of the sea that he might go on and complete his mission, pictured what the Son of Man was to endure in his dying on the cross and then being laid in a tomb uh, for three days, but gloriously and miraculously resurrected from the dead to go on and complete his mission of bringing in God's kingdom. As Kent Hughes wrote, the great and grand sign that Jesus gives to all, and especially those who think that they need miraculous signs in order to believe, is the miracle of his atoning death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. That's apostolic preaching as we find it in our New Testaments. Uh, Paul, for example, capsulized it by writing in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that God raised him again according to uh, the scriptures on the third day. Christ resurrected is the only sign a person needs. Uh, but one must advance beyond merely hearing uh, that story, that gospel, or even knowing its elements. One must believe it. Uh, here it is again. It's obedience. It's what the Bible calls the obedience of faith. But then in uh, verse 31, uh, the Lord uh, doubles down on his condemnation of these sign seekers by making reference to an incident in the life of King Solomon uh, now, uh, recorded in 1 Kings 10 and 2 Chronicles 9. When the queen of the south, which we are to understand is some kind of euphemism for the queen of Sheba, uh, she traveled the long and arduous journey from what Jesus calls the ends of the earth, probably modern Yemen in South Arabia, just to hear the wisdom of King Solomon. Now we all know the figure of Solomon was synonymous with uh, wisdom. We just spent, what, seven years? <laughs> going through the, Mike, are you listening? We just spent seven years <laughs> Uh, go, going through his, his wisdom. And um, uh, the Old Testament passages uh, descri describing the Queen of Sheba's uh, visit to meet him record her awe at the breadth, uh, the depth of, of his wisdom. Uh, when she saw it, when she beheld it, she was breathless, the, the chronicler says. We don't want one jewel to be lost. <laughs> she was breathless, uh, believing that what she had heard before about him uh, was not the half of the greatness of his wisdom. But Solomon's wisdom, while ad admittedly great, was merely a derived wisdom from the one who was in uh, the Jewish 
crowds midst that very day and who in truth was wisdom personified. He was the one of whom uh, Paul would later say became for us wisdom from God and the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The queen of Sheba was a Gentile. She was probably a pagan even. Uh, and yet she came from far, far away to hear Solomon's wisdom and she was rewarded for her troubles. But now standing in their midst was wisdom incarnate. Uh, and these evil skeptics were insulting him by their request for more signs. Uh, if they would only believe his words, uh, all his wisdom was there for the taking. Instead, they continually rejected him. And for that reason, Jesus now says, the queen of the south will rise up with them at the judgment and condemn them. The, moving on to, to 32, the men of Nineveh likewise will do the same, he, he goes on to say, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And, and behold, something greater than Jonah is, is here. So we see, I think it's important for us to understand this, to understand this. Uh, there were two levels of contrast uh, behind the Lord's charges. The inept response of Jesus' Jesus's audience to the word he gave to them, one, and two, the vast qualitative superiority of the preacher. On the one hand, the Queen of Sheba and the Ninevites. On the other hand, Solomon and Jonah. He, Solomon, Solomon was a great uh, king. Jonah was a prophet. Jesus was the prophet. He was is the king of the universe. Jonah was the epitome of obstinacy and, and weakness, and it took God's supernatural intervention in his life as he ran away from his duty to rein him in and spur him on to bring the message of repentance to the people of uh, Nineveh. But it was likely the very miracle that God performed in delivering Jonah from the belly of the fish after three days, uh, the details of which might have somehow been communicated to the Ninevites that God used to bring them to repentance. God cared about the people of Nineveh. I can't remember when we last studied the book of Jonah, but that became apparent. God cared about them. Uh, he wanted them to repent. He wanted them to receive the message of repentance. And if Jonah would not go to them in obedience with God's message to them, then he would make Jonah a sign to them. And now we understand further that both sayings, that the Queen of Sheba and that of the Queen of Sheba and that of Jonah and the Ninevites contrast the appeal of the word of God to Gentiles in Old Testament times with the failure of Jesus' own contemporaries to respond to the even clearer and greater revelation given by him. Now, let's apply this to ourselves, to our own world. We can only imagine uh, the even higher level of judgment upon our own generation. Uh, we talk a lot about the skepticism and the naturalism and uh, the, uh, the laissez-faire um, morality of the spirit of our age and how it all combines to make belief in traditional Christianity difficult for people to accept. But the reality is uh, we, our generations, have greater resources surrounding us that should abet belief instead of inhibiting uh, belief. We have blanketed the world with the Word of God, haven't we? It's available with the click of a mouse. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be driving down the highway, moving the steering wheel with your knees. Not that I'd ever do that, but, <laughs> and pull up the, pull up the scripture you, you want on your, on your Bible app. 
uh, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of spirit-led insight into the scriptures uh, available with only the slightest uh, effort. If, if we'll just sit down at our desk or on the couch for that matter or in, in bed, we can pull that up. Of 2,000 years of archeological discoveries that reinforce the trustworthiness of the scriptures, we know more about our universe, about the mind-boggling complexities of it, uh, from the tiniest atomic particle to the most vast expanse of the heavens with man-launched uh, cameras sending images of the farthest reaches of our universe back to our smartphones uh, that, so that we can sit on our patio and marvel at them. We live in an enlightened age, and, and God holds Earth's inhabitants responsible to respond to the light that comes to us. But alas, there is also darkness. And that contrast is the theme uh, behind Jesus' final illustration in verses 33 through 36. Now, I, I, I want you to admit that, that reading along, one might wonder, uh, what is the connection uh, between Jesus' condemnation of the evil generation in which he ministered for their lack of response to his preaching, and what he now takes up with his reference to a lamp placed on a lampstand, stand, and then the eye and how it serves to either bring in light or keep one's inner person in darkness. Here's the connection. We are to understand him to be answering a question. Why is this an evil generation that cannot comprehend the truth he brings? The answer is sin that prevents them from benefiting from the light that he brings. Jesus is the light of the world, and he came into the world to enlighten the dark hearts of sinful man. But as the Apostle John wrote in his gospel, in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, this is the verdict, he says, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light and their deeds were evil. Why is that? It's because of the condition of their hearts. Now, perhaps you remember or you, or you can see the cross-reference in the margin of your Bibles next to verse 33 there. Uh, the Lord had said much the same thing not too long before in Luke chapter 8 and verse 16. You can turn to that if you want to, but this is what it reads, Luke 8, 16, just, just shortly before this. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. Okay, but the context there is incredibly revealing. It's the key to the whole thing because it comes directly after the parable of the soils maybe the greatest of Jesus' parables. The, and that, that verse comes right after the parable of the soils, which we can just, for our purposes, quickly summarize by saying that the key to the seed of the Word of God taking root in the hearts of men and women is the condition of the soil, that is, of the heart. And he'll later turn in chapter 10, verse 23, he'll, he'll, he'll turn away from the multitudes, and he'll turn to his disciples, and he'll address them directly. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, see the things that you see. He might just as well have said, blessed are the hearts which comprehend the truth that I bring. Jesus loved to use this figurative language from, uh, every, from the everyday world. Uh, he goes from seed and soils to lamps 
in light to what can be seen by infants, but is hidden to the wise. And now he's back to the lamp, back to the lamp radiating uh, light. And so this is the illustration Jesus now gives. What is the function of light? Now, I'm simplifying it. There's a lot of functions of light, but what is the primary function of light? It's to shine in order to reveal things. Therefore, a lamp shouldn't be hidden or kept secret, but utilized in ways in which its light will reach the furthest and benefit uh, the most. So what do we do? We put it on a lampstand. Uh, it makes no sense to take the lamp, which is for light, so that we can see things and put it somewhere like some decorator might do where it doesn't work for light. It's just there as a pretty object. But uh, So still, only those with eyes to see will benefit from it. Blessed are the eyes which see. And then in verse 34, he, he changes his metaphor, okay? So we go from a lamp uh, now, uh, uh, from a lamp as the revelation of God in his word to the eye which allows the light into a person. The eye stands for a person's perception and uh, knowledge, but especially in this case to spiritual perception. Uh, the entrance of God's light into our bodies, that is into our very beings, our personal experience, depends on that eye of spiritual perception, which functions as a lamp relaying God's light into us. If it's clear, if it's healthy, then we'll be full of light. That's what happened to you through nothing that you did or I did, but that's what happened. God made your eye clear through regeneration. He gave you eyes to, to see. But if your eye is bad, clouded over, murky, then your entire soul will know nothing uh, but darkness. And that's man in his natural, man and woman in their natural state. He's essentially blind and unable to perceive uh, spiritual truth. It's 1 uh, Corinthians 2.14. That's exactly what it is. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness to him, he cannot understand, in inability, he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. He is spiritually blind. His eye is bad. It's a bad eye. The people surrounding Jesus on this day did not need any more signs. They needed hearts to believe. They needed clear eyes to see. And the Lord lays that responsibility upon them. That's verse 35 now. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. He bids them examine, to examine their hearts to determine whether what they think is the light of knowledge and truth is really darkness. And the verse that follows, the final verse of our passage, verse 36, serves as the encouragement today. Uh, because if your whole body is, is full of light like that, with no dark part in it, then you'll be wholly illumined and spiritually whole and able to hear God's word and observe it. It's his invitation. Let the light in. Let the sun, S-O-N, sun, shine into your soul. And there are only two possible responses. And it's every person's uh, decision to make. Will you open your heart to the light of his gospel and enjoy the promise of knowing your Savior and welcoming his word and experiencing God in all of his majesty and his love and his grace and his kindness. That's what the apostle Paul confessed in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of, of, of Christ. That was his testimony. Or is your spiritual perception so blurred by sin that what you think is light is really the darkness 
of unbelief. Watch out. Watch out, the Lord Jesus Christ says, that that is not the case with you. There's an old adage that's true, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. So, the greatest beatitude in the Bible is the one in our passage today. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Let in the light, the British hymn writer J.R.P.C. wrote, let in the light all sin expose to Christ whose life no darkness knows. I'm confident looking out on this group uh, that uh, all of us have, have let that light in by God's uh, grace. Praise the Lord uh, for that. Let's pray. Lord, you are light. We read in your word, you are love. Uh, there are so many wonderful things uh, about you, your attributes that are too wonderful uh, for words. We can't comprehend them all. Uh, but we do know this, when you speak to us, we should listen. Uh, and when we, as we listen, we should follow through and uh, obey. We should observe. And these are things, Lord, that we confess we face every day of our lives. Uh, we will face it this afternoon. Uh, no, um, no minister of the Word of God is ever so holy as when he stands in a pulpit or at a, at a pedestal like this, but we leave this place and we're faced with uh, the worries and, and trials of this world. And we need your grace, Lord, the, the power of your Holy Spirit uh, to make us uh, obedient to you, to make us hear, not just hear, but long to hear your word and then fulfill it. We pray all this in Christ's name, amen.